Wilfred Owen came from a lower middle class background, four children uh, to be brought up, so there was never any spare cash around. Owen was a committed poet from his late teens onwards. He was a great admirer of Keats and, he, uh, and other romantics, Wordsworth in particular, and he knew from them that to be a poet was the greatest calling that anybody could possibly have, and he had never had any doubt that that's what he wanted to be. He was sent out to France at the beginning of 1917, and within three weeks he was in one of the most appalling circumstances one could possibly imagine, uh, when he was sent into a German dugout in, in uh, no man's land that had recently been captured as a British outpost, and he had to keep his platoon there for 50 hours, he says under constant shell fire, expecting at any minute to be buried alive. The place was slowly flooding with rainwater, with the water rising above their knees, so that at any moment they might have been buried or drowned or just died of shock. They were then taken out for a short period, uh, put back in again in a quite different situation on the top of a hill in very hard frost. So it had been heavy rain and mud, but now it was bitter frost and they were out on the snow exposed unable to move. Uh, one man in his platoon froze to death and he was eventually almost killed by a shell that dropped near his head while he was asleep and he was blown into the air and that finally broke his nerve. In World War I it was called shell shock. In World War II it was called combat neurosis and now it's called post-traumatic stress disorder, but it's all the same phenomenon. There will always be psychological injuries in war, just like there are always physical injuries. And the historical record is that they rise and fall together. What spills blood spills spirit. I, I don't believe that the trauma of, of combat ever goes away, uh, whether you win or lose the war, you know? Uh, my father used to wake up at night. I know plenty of World War II vets, the last good war, the, the war we won, the war that, that, that saved the whole world. I know plenty of them that still wake up nights. Uh, you don't go through things that are that, are that unnatural, that are that unholy. Uh, you don't go through them unchanged. Now, Wilfred Owen was already at Craig Lockhart, and he was suffering from shell shock. Sassoon, in a sense, undertook the the tutelage of Owen. It was a wonderful good fortune of Owen's that he should have met Sassoon when he did because Sassoon showed him how to find his own voice and to find his own subject. I saw his round mouth's crimson deepen as it fell like a sun in his last deep hour. Watch the magnificent recession of farewell clouding half gleam half glower and a last splendor burn the heavens of his cheek, and in his eyes the cold stars lighting, very old and bleak, in different skies. People who have been through heavy fighting where many people have died seem to carry a kind of imprint of death on them where the dead are more real to them than the living. Owen speaks of such people as the men whose minds the dead have ravaged. Above all, I am not concerned with poetry. My subject is war and the pity of war. The poetry is in the pity. All a poet can do today is warn. That is why true poets must be truthful. He had to go back to the front to bear witness. And he says in one of his letters, um, I came out to lead these boys as well as an officer can um, and to watch their sufferings that I may speak of them as well as a pleader can. And so he goes back so that he can testify to the horrors of the war. And I think he went knowing he wouldn't come back. They were trying to throw a pontoon bridge over a canal, and the Germans' machine guns were about 30 yards away. And these chaps were just carrying their pontoons, putting them in the river, and Owen went backwards and forwards between them, saying, you're doing very well, my boy. Just move that little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. You're doing very well, you're doing very well. And then he was hit and killed. 
Oh, Jesus Christ, I'm hit, he said, and died. Whether he vainly cursed or prayed indeed, the bullets chirped in vain, vain, vain. Machine guns chuckled, tut, 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 and the big gun guffawed. Another sighed, oh, mother, mother, dad, then smiled at nothing, childlike being dead. And the lofty shrapnel cloud leisurely gestured, fool, and the splinters spat and tittered. My love, one moaned. Love languid seemed his mood, till slowly lowered his whole face kissed the mud, and the bayonet's long teeth grinned. Rabbles of shells hooted and groaned, and the gas hissed. As the bells were ringing for the armistice in Shrewsbury, where his parents lived, their front doorbell rang, ringing the telegram saying that he was killed. I think Wilfred Owen is uh, uh, probably the archetype of uh, a poet who uh, comes in with a romantic feeling and just recoils at that horror, um, and probably writes the, the best war poetry of World War I. I don't think there's another poet of the Great War to, to equal him. True poets must be truthful. <laughs>